Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of A Vision for You. Today is Sunday, November 26, 2017. The share IDs for Friday, November 24th, are the following. For the 7 a.m. Eastern Big Book Study, 10709. And for the 10 a.m. Eastern Big Book Study, 10711. This morning, A Vision for You presents the impossible story of the Big Book that saved so many. The book Alcoholics Anonymous, lovingly referred to as the big book, is one of the most influential books and best-selling books of all time, having sold over 30 million copies. In fact, in 2012, the Library of Congress designated it as one of the 88 books that shaped America. The text of the first 164 pages of Alcoholics Anonymous unchanged since they first came off the press in 1939, evolved from a process of furious debate and wise compromise. A group of ex-problem drinkers decided upon a book in which they could tell other alcoholics the very good news. The almost 100 recovered alcoholics inscribed in it the essence of their experience. It was the product of thousands of hours of discussion. It truly represented the collective voice, faith, heart, and conscience of those who pioneered the first four years of AA. It's not a book of theory or philosophy. It offers a clear step-by-step approach for recovery. In fact, the first 164 pages have been left untouched because no one has been able to improve on the program of recovery found in the big book. Today, the Big Book textbook has been translated into 70 languages, helping millions of men and women throughout the world and in all walks of life find a new life and a new freedom. Joining us today to tell the impossible story of the Big Book is Harlan G., a recovered compulsive overeater from Scottsdale, Arizona. Harlan is a magnificent messenger and a loyal servant of Overeaters Anonymous. Welcome to you, Harlan. Thank you very much, Leah, and thank you for making this fabulous special edition possible. I'm honored to be here. I'm Harlan G., and as Leah told you, I'm a recovered compulsive overeater, and I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm alive today because of the story that we're going to examine this morning, and today would be the 122nd birthday of my hero and my messenger, Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson was born on November the 26th, 1895, so he'd be 122 years old today. And Bill Wilson is credited as being the major author of the big book, but I really believe he was the chief scribe because it's always been my belief that the book was written by a power greater than us. Let's go back to 1937. Alcoholics Anonymous uh, started really in, on the June the 10th, 1935. It hadn't broken away from the Oxford group just yet. That wasn't to come until 39. But Alcoholics Anonymous was in its infancy at this time. And Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob in the summer of 1937 were sitting in Akron, Ohio, in the living room of Dr. Bob Smith's house on Ardmore Street in Akron. And they were counting noses of who was sober in both New York and Akron. And at that time, they had come up with about 40 people that had achieved sobriety. And they started to ponder how the message could best be carried to people beyond what they already had. And they made a decision that they needed to do three things. Akron City Hospital was getting more and more upset with the alcoholics being in their wards, taking up spaces for people with broken legs or sick kidneys or whatever it is. And Akron City Hospital was making life a little bit difficult for 
a doctor to admit an alcoholic. And so the first thing that they decided to do in 1937 was they decided that they needed a chain of hospitals. They needed a chain of drug, of, of drunk tanks. Bill was from Wall Street, and he saw the effectiveness of chain drug stores, chain uh, supermarkets, chain hardware stores, and what have you. And he believed in his heart that a chain of drunk tanks would be just what the doctor ordered. Now, they also decided that they needed a series of missionaries. Now, Dr. Bob was going to be the chief doctor of these drunk tanks, and Bill Wilson was going to be the chief missionary that would carry this message of recovery hither and yon. They were going to go to Los Angeles and San Diego and Chicago and Keokuk and Oklahoma, what have you, and they were going to carry this message, and Bill was going to be in charge of the message-carrying missionaries. And third, last but not least, they decided in the summer of 1937 that a book was necessary to codify this message, because up until now, what was happening was Joe over here, he would get sober, so everybody would follow Joe. And then Mike over here, he would get sober, so they would follow Mike. And then, you know, what, whoever was the latest, greatest uh, method of getting sober, that's who they would follow. And it was a word-of-mouth program that was getting jarbled and distorted. You know, when you're a little kid, you play telephone, it gets jarbled and distorted. And so they decided that they needed to write a book that would codify this message. Bill was in Akron, and they got in touch with T. Henry and Clarice Williams, whose home they met in many times because this was a big uh, Oxford group meeting place, was the home of T. Henry and Clarice Williams. And in 1937, the summer of 37, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob gathered together for the purpose of meeting about these things in the home of T. Henry Williams, 18 Oxford Group members. And Bill Wilson gets up because he was the promoter, and he says to these 18 gathered people, some alcoholics, some not, that they needed a series of drunk tanks, they needed a series of uh, missionaries, and they needed a book. Well, they needed money to do these things. You can't just have a book and hospitals and missionaries and so on and so forth. And the one thing that Bill Wilson was very surprised at was they weren't real keen on the missionaries. They said, this is not good. And they weren't real keen on the series of drunk tanks and they weren't real keen on the book, and this shocked Bill. And the reason that it shocked Bill was it was very hard for him to understand that if he believed in something so strongly, and he believed in his abilities as a salesperson, remember Bill was a very, very successful Wall Street investment counselor whose opinions were followed by many to the tune of paper millions, and he was used to power driving his way through things. They said to him, they're going to take a vote, and they took a vote, and winning by about two was the idea of the book. Well, Bill wasn't going to hear this. He wanted the drunk tanks. He wanted the hospital, uh, the missionaries. He wanted the book. But they said to him in Akron, you better get back to New York and raise this money because the people in Akron said, hey, the people in New York got all the money. So Bill Wilson goes back to New York. And he contacts some of his people that he knew from his Wall Street days. And he's contacting person after person after person. And he's telling them about this magnificent idea that is going to raise an awareness of alcoholism and to, to have this cure for alcoholism, this remedy for alcoholism. And he gets the stony stare from each and every one of them. 
They're not even the slightest bit interested. And Bill is in a state where he just can't believe that this idea isn't catching fire. Bill's brother-in-law was one of the very, very few people besides Lois that stuck with him through everything. Remembering Bill's story, it says, my brother-in-law is a physician, and through him and my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital. Well, this brother-in-law is Dr. Leonard Strong, and Dr. Leonard Strong was married to Bill's sister, Dorothy, and he had his medical offices in Poughkeepsie, New York, and Bill decides that he's going to take a ride on the train up to Poughkeepsie to see Leonard, and he goes up there to see Leonard Strong, and Leonard sees him, and between patients, he sits down with Bill, and he says this. Now, I'm going to say this twice because this is how, this is how tenuous, this is how shaky this thing came together. Now, let's take a look at what Leonard says. I knew a girl from grade school, and I think she had an uncle that was tied in to the Rockefellers. Let me say that again so you can absorb it. I knew a girl in grade school, and I think she had an uncle that was tied in with the Rockefellers. Pretty tenuous. He says to Bill, would you like me to give him a call? Well, Bill says, Rockefellers, sure, give him a call. So Leonard calls up the offices of the Rockefeller, the Rockefeller offices up at 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. And to the phone comes a man who is as gentle and benign a Christian gentleman as there is on planet Earth. And his name is Willard Richardson. And Willard Richardson comes to the phone, and after Len identifies himself, he says to Len, why, Len, where have you been all these years? And Len says to Willard Richardson, my brother-in-law has a cure for alcoholism. Now, let's remember something that I didn't say. We're talking about John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller was called Junior. He was a very adamant opponent of drinking and supported prohibition. He didn't like drinking. He was a religious man. He did not drink. He didn't think others should drink either. Willard Richardson is perhaps J.D.'s closest friend. And he works at the Rockefeller Foundation, and he works for the Rockefellers, and he is in New York, and he says to Leonard, and he says to Bill, why don't you guys come down here and we'll talk? Willard Richardson receives Bill Wilson at 30 Rockefeller Plaza on the 58th floor, and they talk, and they talk. And Willard is strangely absorbed by this discussion of alcoholism and a spiritual uh, remedy for that alcoholism. He's very strangely stirred by all this. And Willard Richardson says, Mr. Wilson, or Bill, if I can call you that, he says, would you like to meet with me? I would love you to meet with some of my very good friends who are very close to the Rockefellers, who I want you to meet, and these people are very influential, and let's see what they think of this idea. So Bill Wilson says, absolutely, no problem. Let's do this. And they set up a meeting with Rockefeller, Frank Amos. He's in the advertising business, and he was on the committee that recommended that Mr. Rockefeller shut up about the prohibition business because it wasn't good for his public image. And then there was Leroy Chipman, and he looked after Mr. Rockefeller's real estate. And then there was Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott was the chairman of the board of a very large engineering firm, but he was also the chairman of the board of the Riverside Church, and that's where Rockefeller attended. And a number of other people that they were involved with decided to throw a dinner 
on a winter's night in 1937, <clears throat> excuse me, at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, where Bill Wilson and some of these other alcoholics could tell their stories. And <clears throat> Bill calls up Dr. Bob, and he arranges, sorry, my focaccia allergies are acting up again. Um, he arranges a meeting, and on a winter's night in 1937, Dr. Bob headed the procession of people from Akron, and there were people from New York. And oh, by the way, Dr. Silkworth also came. And when they heard the words of Dr. Silkworth, this whole committee was very stirred. And Dr. Silkworth spoke, and he spoke eloquently, and he spoke, spoke from the standpoint of a physician which held great weight with these people of what he had seen and the miracles that he had seen, not only in Bill Wilson, but in Hank Parkhurst and Fitz Mayo and Jimmy Burwell. And he spoke of the miracles that he had seen in New York. And Dr. Bob was also there. And at that meeting, at that meeting, Willard Richardson <laughs> excuse me, was sitting next to Mr. Scott, and Mr. Scott gets up in front of the entire meeting, and he says to the meeting, gentlemen, up to this point, this has been a work of goodwill only, no plan, no property, no paid people, just one person carrying the good news to the next. Isn't that true? And they said, yes, it may not be that this is where the great power of this society lies. Now, if we subsidize it, it might alter its whole character. We will do what we can. We're gathered for that. But he says, won't money ruin this thing? And that's when the alcoholics froze because they wanted the money that these guys could provide. There was billions of dollars in that room. Billions of dollars in the 1930s was like the trillions of dollars now. And they're backed up to all this money and they can't believe what they're hearing. But Frank Amos, who was one of the other people that was on this committee, he says, I would like to check this out. I would really like to check this out. So they agreed that he could check it out. That was fine but they felt that he would get a better picture of it in Akron rather than New York because in Akron there were more sober people. So Frank Amos goes out to Akron in 1937 at his own expense, and he checks out what's going on in those Oxford groupers that were drunks getting sober in the Oxford group. He checks out Dr. Bob. And he finds out that people tell him that Dr. Bob is a wonderful, wonderful guy, but that he's drunk, that he's a drunk, but lately he's been sober. And the drunks out there are trying to put the muscle on Frank Amos for $50,000. And the reason that they want $50,000 is they figure this is a good way to get the book started, the chain of drunk tanks, they haven't let that go, and the... Uh, missionaries. The missionaries, the drunk tanks, they could clear up the mortgage on Dr. Smith's house and they could, you know, get themselves going for about $50,000. Now, Frank Amos goes back to New York and he files his report with Willard Richardson. Willard Richardson brings the report into J.D. Rockefeller. J.D. Rockefeller <clears throat> calls in Willard Richardson after a couple of hours, and he says to Willard Richardson, I am not going to be the one to spoil this thing. I'm just not going to be the one to spoil this thing with money. And he says, this is going to ruin it. And he says, but I will do, I will put $5,000 in the Riverside Church Treasury and these guys can draw upon it as they see fit. Well, $3,000 of that money went to Dr. Bob to clear up the mortgage on his house because even though he was sober, he was a surgeon. And a lot of people don't want to be carved up by an alcoholic surgeon. They're just funny that way. And the other $2,000 
went to Bill Wilson to clean up because this was 37. Now, Lois is still in the department store working. Bill is not employed, and the drunks at 182 Clinton Street are eating the Wilsons out of house and home. And the Wilsons are in trouble, so Bill had $2,000. Dr. Bob had $3,000, but that was a long way from starting the string of drunk tanks and the uh, book project and the missionaries. And they figured, what in the name are we going to do? And they had some more meetings with Amos Richardson, Scott, and Shipman. And these fellows stuck with them. And they suggested that in sort of like, like the Rockefeller Foundation, that they too needed to start a foundation of these alcoholics where contributions could come in and decisions could be made. And Bill Wilson figures, hmm, I would like it to be a foundation like the Rockefellers so that it was wealthy. So they formed the Alcoholic Foundation, not the Alcoholics Foundation, apostrophe S, but the Alcoholic Foundation. I'm not sure if the foundation was alcoholic or what, but they drew up the charter. And on the charter, they wanted it to be four non-alcoholics and three alcoholics. They didn't want the alcoholics to be in the majority because they felt that would not be a good position for them to be in. And the lawyer comes in, and he's starting to draw up the charter, and he says to Bill Wilson, now what is the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic? And Bill at that time didn't know what to tell the guy. And so one of the other alcoholics speaks up, and he says, well, sir, he says an alcoholic is someone who can't drink, and the non-alcoholic is someone who can drink. So Dr. Bob, he went on the um, foundation, and there were a couple more, and the four non-alcoholics were Leonard Strong, Willard Richardson, I believe Dr. Silkworth, and I believe Frank Chipman was on the, was, were the four non-alcoholics on the alcoholic, in the alcoholic foundation. And this, so now we've got the book project, which is kind of moving forward. In 37, there were two chapters of the book written by Bill in late 1937. He wrote his own story, which we know today as Bill's story, page 1 through 16. And he wrote the, what we would call it the forward to the first edition. In those days, in that time, it was just the introduction. They didn't know there was going to be other editions. They couldn't see, you know, that far into the future. So it wasn't called the forward to the first edition at that time. I believe it was just called the preface. And in 19, now we're going into 1938. We've got two chapters of a book written, Bill's story and the preface. Okay, now we're going into 1938. And Bill is trying to solicit funds from anybody he can get his hands on. And he's soliciting the rich. And the foundation is soliciting these people. And these people that are wealthy, that the Rockefellers turn them on to, not just Chipman and Amos and, and Richardson and uh, these guys, but these other people that were there, the bankers that were associated with Rockefeller, the real estate people that were associated with Rockefeller. And Bill Wilson is trying to solicit them, and they didn't get one thin dime. Praise God. Praise God. And 1938 is coming, and the book project is, doesn't have any money, but they're starting to formulate what they're going to put into the book. And they start writing some chapters. Now, the chapters are being written this way. They would triple Ruth Hawk, Hank Parkhurst, who I haven't mentioned yet. Hank Parkhurst was a power driver, 10 times the energy of Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson was a promoter. Hank Parkhurst was a promoter extraordinaire. He had thick red hair, and he, would, he worked with Bill. Uh, they were going to start an automobile polish business that failed. But anyway, they're at 17 Williams Street in Newark, New Jersey. So when we had our convention for Vision and we were in Newark, 
that is actually the city where most of the big book was written was in Newark, New Jersey, 17 William Street. So anyway, they've got Ruth Hock doing the typing, and what she's doing is she's typing the book triple space, and she's triple spacing the book, and so what happens then is they would, send, they would do three copies. They would use carbon paper. Anybody old enough to remember carbon paper? Okay, I see a few hands on the phone here. Great. Okay, I remember carbon paper too. <laughs> okay. So they're using carbon paper, and they're making three copies of everything that they're typing. Ruth Hock is typing. She's throwing in some things. Hank Parkhurst is throwing in things. But the main contributor is Bill Wilson. And each copy is one is kept in the office, one is sent to Akron to be passed around to the boys in Akron, and one is kept in New York to be passed around when they have their meetings at the Cavalry Mission or whether they're going to 182 Clinton Street or what have you. And there's contributions being made. Take this out, put this in, take this out, put this in. And as the book is being formulated, as the book is being written, there are four major books that are influential in its configuration. The first book that is absolutely essential, absolutely essential to the book being written is the book of James in the New Testament. This is the heavy influence of the Oxford groupers, and in the book of James, which I am not an expert in, I'm a Jewish boy from Chicago, but the book of James emphasized the need for action, that faith in and of itself was great, but if it wasn't translated into action, it was of no avail. In other words, faith without works was dead, she said. Okay, so this is very, very important. But let's go to four major publications besides that, and the heavy influence of the Oxford group, let's go to four books that are influencing the working of the big book. The Common Sense of Drinking by Richard Peabody. Now, Richard Peabody died in his alcoholism, but had an 11-year sobriety gap in there in which he was clean and crazy. He was not recovered. He was clean and crazy. He missed the part that we're going to be talking about here in just a minute. He missed the part about the spiritual awakening. But what he got right was this. What Peabody got right was that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And you can see the influence of Peabody more in Chapter 3, more about alcoholism than you can pretty much anywhere else. But this idea that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, and I hear people on the line all the time saying, I was a cucumber, now I'm a pickle, I can't go back to being a cucumber. This idea goes back to the common sense of drinking by Richard Peabody, a very, very uh, influential book on our big book. Number two, and this was a book that was given by Ebby to Bill when he visits him in the town's hospital. If you remember back in Bill's story on page 13, it says in the middle, my schoolmate visited me in the middle of 13, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. Well, Ebby Thatcher had a book under his arm. And the book that he had under his arm to give to Bill Wilson as a gift was a book that was being very widely read in the Oxford group, and it's called The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. And the varieties of, William, of religious experience by William James was a book about people who through calamity in their life found God. And that's why you have the stories in the back of the big book. This entire idea of telling your story, what you were like, what happened, and what you're like now comes from the varieties of religious experience by William James. And then there's the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox. Now, it's been 30 years since I've read this book, but this book is about the Beatitudes and it's about the Lord's Prayer 
and it's about what Jesus taught and Christianity teaches and so on. Again, in the question and answer period, please, I'm a little Jewish, I'm a chubby Jewish boy from Chicago. I'm not, I'm not that up on it. But what I can tell you that the Sermon on the Mount did was it influenced heavily the formation of the big book. And that's why you hear in AA meetings that they will say the Lord's Prayer after every meeting. And this custom started because of the heavy influence of the Sermon of the Mount. And there was another book called Disbelieving World by Lewis Brown. And this was a book, excuse me, about God and spirituality. Now, as the chapters are being written, there's a couple of things that need to be brought out here because they are integral. I don't know how to tell you how vital these things are without saying that without these ideals, we wouldn't have a program. Let's look at the doctor's opinion. Let's look at Bill's story. Chapter two, uh, there is a solution. And chapter three, more about alcoholism. What is integral to all those chapters that they relate to what? They relate to step one. All of those chapters that I mentioned relate to step one. Now, Dr. Silkworth teaches us in the doctor's opinion that we must be entirely abstinent. He tells us three times in the doctor's opinion that we must be free of the physical craving. And in order to be free of the physical craving, what do I have to do? I have to put the food down. I cannot be eating M&Ms. I cannot be eating stuffing from the turkey. I cannot be eating cranberry sauce. These are just for me. I don't know what it is for you. I can't be eating these things and have a spiritual awakening as the result of anything. And Dr. Silkworth tells us in his doctor's opinion that doctors know what's wrong with us, but there's nothing they can really do. Now, when I had my hips replaced or my knee replaced, or if I get a strep throat, I don't take that to a meeting and say, cure me. I go to a doctor. But when I'm suffering from compulsive overeating, when I am in a situation where I can't get in and out of a car, I go to an OA meeting. And what is Dr. Silkworth's real influence? It's on everything we touch. And that he teaches us that food is not the problem. He teaches us in the doctor's opinion, and this is reinforced in Bill's story and reinforced in chapter two where it says the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. And, he's, and in chapter two, it says the cessation of drinking is but a beginning and that we have to work the rest of the steps. That food is never the problem. That food is the solution to the problem. Now, if food was the problem, there'd be a one-step program. Don't eat. Don't eat certain foods. And you'll never you know, want them again, and that's fine. Food is not the problem. I can see, I can prove that food isn't the problem. If food was the problem, treatment centers would turn out 100% winners, and they don't. If food was the problem, gastric bypass would work 100% of the time, and it doesn't. If food was the problem, hospitals would turn out winners, and they don't. Diets would work, and they don't for people like me. Food is a solution to the problem. Now, if food is the solution to the problem, what is the problem? The problem, for people like me, is the buildup of everyday, normal, human emotion. Now, all human beings have fear, anger, jealousy, happiness. Happiness is an emotion, too. Happiness, regret, remorse love, hate, whatever we have. And in a normal person, those emotions will reduce when simple things are done. And you see them every day. They go to the gym, they're good. They walk the dog, they're good. They play with the cat, they're good. Not so with people like me. 
with people like me, when I'm scared or I'm angry, it will produce in me a pain that comes from not eating that is absolutely unbearable. I cannot stand the pain of not eating. And so my mind will focus in on the ease and comfort that comes instantly. What does Dr. Silkworth call it? The effect. He calls it the effect. He says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And my mental twist will activate and tell me that it is perfectly okay for me to eat M&Ms with peanuts. I have no idea why people eat M&Ms without peanuts, but that's for another discussion. So it will tell me that it's okay for me to eat M&Ms with peanuts. And the intelligent side of my brain says, you better not eat those M&Ms with peanuts because you want to look good. You've got a cardiologist appointment coming up. You want to be at a good weight, you want to have good, clean bill of health, and the other emotional side of my brain will call in its ally, the mental blank spot. See, the mental twist can't do it without the mental blank spot. The mental twist says eat the food. The mental blank spot is that instant, effective forgetter, and I cannot remember what the food does to me. I can only focus in on what the food will do for me. And when I remember the sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly by eating the food, I will justify in my mind that this time I'm just going to have two Oreo cookies. That's it, two. I'm going to have two Oreo cookies and I'm going to seal up the bag and that will be it. And I eat an Oreo cookie. And for about eight seconds, the world is a very groovy place. The world is a beautiful place. Everything is beautiful. Everything is great. Oh, my God, it's orgasmic. But about nine, ten seconds in, I feel the horror and the pall of the remorse is upon me. And there's a black curtain in my life because once again, I've eaten Oreo cookies. And then the uglier, ugly, ugly, ugly physical allergy takes over because now that Oreo cookie is inside of me and it is producing an actual physical craving for more of the same. And I keep eating Oreo cookies. And I eat them, and I eat them, and I eat them, and they're all gone. Now I'm eating ice cream. Now I'm eating pizza. Now I'm eating whatever. I'm eating and eating and eating, and the more I eat, the more I want, the more I want, the more I eat, and it's just endless. What am I going to do? Now I can't eat because of the allergy, and I can't keep from eating because of the mental twist. So what am I going to do? Well, the process of bringing a power greater than myself into this equation is simply called recovery. And that's what this is all about, Charlie Brown. This is about substituting the effect of the food for the effect of the spiritual awakening. And the book is formulated to point me in the direction that I am powerless over food, my life is unmanageable, and only a spiritual awakening will help me. Now, where does this idea, now we get the problem in the book from Dr. Silkworth, don't we? Dr. Silkworth, our great medical benefactor, teaches me about what the problem is. And Dr. Silkworth twice told Bill Wilson when he was hospitalized at the town's hospital what the problem was. And Bill on the second hospitalization says, I fared forth in high hope for three or four months. The goose hung high. Goose hung high means times were good. A goose is a symbol of prosperity. So this was it. Self-knowledge, but it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. Now, where does this idea in the book come from? Where does this idea of the spiritual awakening come from? 
it comes from the Oxford group. Now let's take a look at the history a little bit here of step two. We're not going to go into the history of every one of the steps. It's not necessary. But we are going to go into the history of step two here because it is not only crucial to the book, but it is crucial to our way of life. Let's go to Rhode Island in our minds. And in Rhode Island, we find Roland Hazard the fourth, the third. Roland Hazard is a wealthy industrialist. He is an American businessman of great wealth. His family was in this country for centuries, and they owned a company called Burlington Mills. And if you've ever walked on carpeting in your life, chances are you've walked on carpeting that his family had something to do with. They were also major stockholders in another company that is traded on the New York Stock Exchange even today, and that company is called Allied Chemical. And Roland was a wealthy boy, but he was a drunk. Oy vey, was he drunk. And Roland wanted to show his mother one last time that he could get sober. And he had himself sequestered on a Caribbean island. And on this Caribbean island, the quartermaster was ordered not to bring him liquor. And he didn't. And for one year, Roland stayed sober on the island. He couldn't get any liquor. There was none there. He stays sober. He gets off the island. He's drunk within, within no time at all. Because when he got off the island, he figured he was cured. He hadn't had a drink in a year. He figured he can drink now, so he comes to Florida, and he's drinking and drunk. Roland wanted a solution. Now, in its infancy, in its infancy was the art, not the science, but the art of psychiatry. There were alienists prior to this, there were other people who, you know, dabbled in this. But the art of psychiatry in the early 30s was in its infancy. And he sought out, remember, money was no object for Roland. He sought out the services of the most preeminent psychiatrist in the world, Dr. Freud. And Dr. Freud, who also celebrates the same, celebrated the same holidays as me, Dr. Freud wasn't taking on any new patients. <laughs> Excuse me, my cocky allergies again. But anyway, Freud wasn't taking on any new patients. So Roland says to Freud's people, who's the number two man? And they said, that's Dr. Adler. And he goes to Adler, and Adler says, no soap. I ain't got no room for you. And he says to Adler and his people, who's the number three guy? And they point him to Switzerland. And in Switzerland... Roland goes under the care of Dr. Carl Jung. And Dr. Jung psychoanalyzes Roland, late 1930 to late 1931. Roland is being psychoanalyzed by Dr. Jung. And Dr. Jung and him are talking, and Jung says, I think you're depressed, or I think you've got Flebus or the Drebus, or you've got you know, whatever you've got. Um, and Roland, after one year, Dr. Jung says, well, my boy, it looks like you're ready to go home. Roland goes to Paris. And while in Paris, he meets up, not deliberately, by accident, with two vacationing people married to each other who happen to be very, very dear friends with Roland's parents. And Roland tells these two people of his sobriety and his, his uh, being cared for by Dr. Jung and how good he feels, and they decide to celebrate Roland's sobriety with a bottle of France's best champagne. Roland is drunk beyond belief in no time flat. He is unable to function. He is unable to get on the ship to go home. He goes back to Switzerland to look at Dr. Jung and say, look at what happened here. Can you help me? And Dr. Jung says, no. 
No. I misdiagnosed you. You are an alcoholic of the hopeless variety, and there is nothing I can do for you. And Dr. Jung is there, and Roland is there, and Roland pleads with Dr. Jung, give me something. Tell me something. I don't want to die. I want to be sober and show my folks. Now, Dr. Jung, now is it odd or is it God that he didn't get to Freud or Adler? Because you see, Freud and Adler, they believe that all solutions lie within the mind. But But Jung broke rank with Freud and Adler in one area and one area only. And the area that he broke rank with with Freud and Adler was he believed, Jung did, that here and there, there were people who could have a spiritual awakening or spiritual experience, if you will, that will alter their ideas, their attitudes, and their behaviors. And he tells this to Roland Hazard. And Roland goes back to New York in search of a spiritual experience. Now, this is the early 30s. Also in its infancy was a group of people founded by Frank Buckman. I'm throwing a lot of names at you guys. Frank Buckman was a Lutheran minister in Pennsylvania who got assigned to a church in England near Oxford University. And Frank Buckman believed that Christians had lost their enthusiasm. There's a good word, enthusiasm. It comes from two Greek words, entheos, from God. They had lost their enthusiasm for Christianity. And Frank Buckman goes to China on a mission and sees people that are enthusiastic about their Christianity. They are enthusiastic in the same way that first century Christians were enthusiastic. And he believed that it is through their altruism, giving with no expectation of return, that he sees this this group of Christians through altruism who are establishing an enthusiasm for their Christianity. And he decides that this is the way we need to go. If you are Christian, this is what you need to do. Now, one of the key guys that he contacted, Buckman, Buckman contacted Sam Shoemaker in New York at the Cavalry Mission. And Sam Shoemaker was an Episcopalian minister who ran the Cavalry Mission, who became an Oxford grouper, And as an Oxford grouper, he was in New York, and Roland Hazard comes to New York in late 32. Roland does not go to a conventional church. He comes into the Oxford group movement, and he meets Sieber Graves Jr., and he meets another guy named Shep Cornell, and they are drunks who are staying sober through the six-step program of the Oxford Group Movement. Now, they don't know the problem. They don't know the physical allergy. They don't know the twist of the mind. But they are doing the six-step program of the Oxford Group Movement, which is complete deflation. Number two, dependence and guidance from a higher power. Number three, moral inventory. Number four, confession number five, restitution, and number six, continued work with other alcoholics. But that wasn't continued work with other alcoholics at that time. It was continuing to tell other people, in other words, give testimony to other people who might come into the Oxford Group movement of what God had done for them. So instead of continued work with other alcoholics, it was give testimony to other Christians. And there were the four absolutes of the Oxford Group movement, that one must be absolute, have absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. And the, most drunks were having trouble saying anything, but absolutely plastered. Now, let's go for just a second to Albany, New York. 
Let's leave Roland and Sieber Graves and Sam Shoemaker and Shep Cornell. Let's leave them in New York City and let's go to Albany, New York in our minds. And in Albany, New York, there lived a family whose father was the mayor of New York, the mayor of Albany, sorry, mayor of Albany. And that family was called the Thatchers. And the Thatchers had a wayward son. And the Thatcher's wayward son was called Edwin Ebby Thatcher. And Ebby Thatcher was a drunk. Now, the Thatcher's, along with the Hazards, had a summer home in Manchester, Vermont. Manchester, Vermont is a place that backs up to East Dorset, Vermont. And Manchester, Vermont is where the rich had their summer cottages. And the Thatchers had a summer cottage in Manchester, Vermont. And <clears throat> my sponsor usually drives like a Michiganer, but in this particular trip, he didn't kill any of us. And we went to, to East Dorset when the Boston Convention was on, and we saw Manchester and we saw East Dorset, which was nice. This is the one time he drove me where I didn't, I didn't uh, expand new vistas of prayer. But anyway, that aside, sorry, John, that aside, um, okay, Ebby Thatcher goes to the summer home. This is my mind. I get distracted. Sorry. Ebby Thatcher goes to the summer home when his mother says to him, get out of town, Edward. I'm sick of looking at your drunk face. Get out of town. Go to the summer home, and we'll be out there when we'll be out there. Ebby goes out to the summer home in Manchester, Vermont. He starts painting. This is the summer of 34. Ebby, uh, uh, Roland has been in the Oxford group for a while now, and he's staying sober in the Oxford group. But Ebby, in the summer of 1934, is out in Manchester, Vermont, painting a wall. And some pigeons land on the gutter. So he does what any normal alcoholic who's drunk does. He goes in and gets his shotgun and starts blasting the wall to get rid of the pigeons. The neighbors get scared. This drunken moron is firing a shotgun, and the police come. And they tell him that he is now on probation, that if there's anything that they have to come out here for because he's drunk and disorderly, he's going to Brattleboro. What is Brattleboro? Brattleboro is not only a city in Vermont, which we drove through safely, I might add. Thanks, John. But, but it is also the place where the insane asylum is in Vermont. And that's what they did with drunks in those days. They put them in the insane asylum. Okay? Ebby is going along. It is now August of 34. He forgets that he's on double secret probation, if you've seen Animal House. Um, he's on double secret probation, and he is now once again drunk and driving. Bad combo. And he drives right into a woman's kitchen, drives right in the house. And without the slightest degree of contrition, without the slightest inference of an apology, he says to the woman, hey, toots, how about a cup of coffee? Well, she calls the police, and the police come. This is August of 34. They arrest Ebby. Ebby, in September of 34, is about to be remanded to Brattleboro Insane Asylum, and he is locked up in the jail. Sheba Graves, Jr., and Roland Hazard are now visiting the Hazards in Rhode Island. Roland is sober, and he has been for a while. Sheba Graves Jr. is sober, and he has been for a while. Neither one of those men knew the problem. They were working the solution. They go to the Hazards. The Hazards are quelling. Quelling is a Jewish word for rapture beyond compare. They're telling that their zun, their son, is sober. And they say to Roland and Sieber Graves Jr., you've been working so hard. Take a vacation. We'll pay. Wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do. 
And Sieber Graves Jr. says to Roland Hazard, you know, I've met your folks and come to your house. I would love to have you come to my home and meet my family. And they decide to go to East Dorset, Vermont, where Sieber Graves Jr. was born and raised. Now, who else do we know that was born in East Dorset, Vermont? Yes, that's right, Bill Wilson, exactly 122 years ago today. And Sieber Graves Jr. and Roland Hazard, upon arriving in East Dorset, Vermont, hear about somebody that they knew, that, and his name was Ebby Thatcher, and he's about to be remanded to Brattleboro. Sieber Graves Jr. and Roland Hazard, in early September 1934, approached the judge in Ebby Thatcher's case to get him released to their care so they can take him down to the Oxford Group in New York and try to sober him up. And the judge in this particular case of Ebby Thatcher happens to be Sebra Graves Sr. Is it odd or is it God? See how tenuous our grip is? The judge in Ebby's case was Sebra's father. Ebby is brought before the judge in September of 34. He signs extradition papers, and the papers state that he must do what the Oxford Group and Sieber Graves Jr. and Roland tell him to do, or he is immediately to be extradited back to Vermont to fill out his sentence at Brattleboro Insane Asylum. So he has two choices, Ebby does. He can go with these guys to a place he doesn't want to go, which is the Oxford Group Movement, or he can go right to the insane asylum. So he figures, okay, I'll go with these guys. And Ebby is now in September of 1934. He is sober from September to October and October to November, two months. And in October, or excuse me, in November of 34, they say to Ebby, you now must go give testimony. And he says, what's that? And they say, go tell other people what God did for you, and maybe they'll come into the Oxford group. And he says, I don't want to go give testimony. That's embarrassing. And they said, you don't have to. You could go to the insane asylum in Brattleboro. And Ebby says, you know, I think I'll go give some testimony. And he goes and he thinks and he thinks and he thinks. Who can he give testimony in New York City to where he won't embarrass himself? This is 1934. This is before Bill was sober. And he comes up with Bill Wilson's name in his head. And Bill and Ebby did a lot of drinking back in Vermont together. They were good friends. And that is where we get step two, the spiritual awakening. That is the origin of how the solution came into the book, into the program, and into our lives. So we get step one from Dr. Silkworth. The problem is Dr. Silkworth's and the solution we get from the Oxford Group Movement, and that is so much of our book. That is so much our book. Now, let's go back if we can. Now, Leah, I'm going to run over just a little bit. I'll try to wrap this up as quickly as I can, but I am going to run over just a bit. Now, in, this, in, in 1938, everybody's sober, except maybe Abby. Everybody's sober, maybe not Roland, but everybody's sober. And this is now 1938. And Frank Amos was one of those guys on the board. And he was one of those guys that was friends with Rockefeller and friends with Willard Richardson. And he says to Bill Wilson, after he sees Bill trying to raise this money, and he can't raise a dime, he says to Bill Wilson, you know, Bill, you've got some chapters written in your book. Why don't you go down to Harper's, which is a publisher, and see an old friend of mine named Gene Xman? Gene X-Men, E-X-M-A-N. He wasn't part of the X-Men in the comic books. He was X-Men, E-X-M-A-N. And he, he runs Harper's. Why don't you go down and see if he'll be interested in publishing your book? And they go down there. 
and the X-Men sees some of the chapters that are written, and he says to Bill, do you think you could write a, a whole book like this? And Bill says, yes, yes, I can. And they offer Bill $1,500, $1,500 as the primary author of the book, and they seem very interested. Now, Hank Parkhurst has a very big part in all this, and he says to Bill Wilson, wait a minute. These guys smell something. Don't you sign anything with them. If they're willing to give you 1500 bucks, there's got to be millions in this thing, Hank says. And he says to Bill, don't you think, honestly, that if this is our book, that we shouldn't control it, that we shouldn't be the publishers of the book? And they start a company without even incorporating it with nothing, they go to a stationery store and they buy shares of stock and they write on their Works Publishing Incorporated, par value $25. And they start trying to sell these shares in the book to the drunks. And the drunks are looking at them like they're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And they says, you want us to buy stock in a book that isn't even finished yet? And they're looking at Bill and they're looking at Hank like they're the creatures from the Black Lagoon. And they look into printing costs and they figure that if the book is about 400 pages, that they could print it for about, oh, about 35 cents and sell it for, oh, about 350. Of course, they don't mention to the drunk's distribution costs and taxes and all this other stuff. They just kind of, you know, leave that stuff out. And the drunks are looking at him like, what? And some of the drunks, after a while, are starting to buy some of the shares, but not until something happened. Bill Wilson started trying to get publicity for this not-yet-finished book in the summer of 38. <sighs> Sorry. I caught the allergies again. My next on but anyway, so Bill goes up to uh, Kenneth Payne, who is one of the guys at the Reader's Digest. They go up there to Pleasantville, uh, New York, and um, he says, now we're friends with the Rockefellers and H Harry Emerson Fosdick. You know, he reviewed what we have so far. and You know, we're traveling in very good company right now. How about a plug from the Reader's Digest? And this guy, Kenneth Payne, who was one of the managing editors there, he says to Bill Wilson, this looks good. This really looks good. He says to him, when you're ready to shoot, when you're ready to shoot, when you've got the book completed, you bring that down here and we'll put one of our feature uh, uh, authors on this and we'll do a, a, a story on this. And Bill says to him, will you plug the book too? And he says, sure, no problem. We'll take care of it. Now, the Reader's Digest in those days had a readership of about 12 million people. This is major, just major, that Kenneth Ping says to Bill Wilson, we are definitely interested in the book, and I'm sure that this would be fantastic. I'm sure this would be great. They go back to the drunks, and some of the shares are now starting to sell. Well, comes to be chapter five, and he's got to put something down. He's got to write chapter five, and this is where the big fight really intensified. He puts down chapter five. He's got to put down the steps. He didn't intend to write 12 of them, but he liked the fact that there were 12 of them. 12 was a significant biblical number. <sighs> 12 was a number that really worked for Bill. He didn't set out to write 12 steps. He set out to close some of the loopholes that were there in the six-step program that the drunks were jumping through. And he was laying in bed one night at 182 Clinton Street that we just, some of us visited when we were in Newark. We went over to Brooklyn Heights and visited Bill's house at 182 Clinton Street. Very, very moving experience. And he writes chapter five. And it was as if the pencil took on a life of its own. He was laying in bed. 
and he wrote chapter five in about 20 minutes, one of the greatest pieces of spiritual literature inside one of the greatest pieces of spiritual literature that the world has ever seen. And he writes it and he brings it to the meeting and the fight was on. What do you mean changing the program? What do you mean? What the heck is this? Uh, what, the, what in the world are you doing here? Six steps has always been fine up until now. What do you have 12 steps for now? You've got these guys on their knees. Stand them up. What, too much God. The, the Akron people wanted more God. The New York people wanted no God. They wanted a psychological book, which had never helped anybody. If the psychological approach had helped them, then they would all but would have been cured years ago. They had been to every loony bin in the place. And so the fight was on. And Bill, it was more like an umpire. And the Akron people and the New York people were slugging it out. And the situation was getting out of hand. And finally, finally, Bill says, stop. Either I'm going to finish this book or you guys can finish the book. And he says, no, they says, no, 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 you finish the book. And then an influence of a New Jersey psychiatrist comes in. One of the people that got a mimeographed copy of Chapter 5 was a psychiatrist in New Jersey named Dr. Howard. And he convinced Bill Wilson that you cannot write a book in the declarative, or excuse me, in the imperative. You must write it in the declarative. What is the difference? An imperative is, is chapter seven. Chapter seven is written in the imperative. You must do this. You must do that. You say this. You say that. You go here. You go there. And he knew Dr. Howard did. And he passed this information to Bill that an alcoholic or a compulsive overeater or a gambler or whatever you have, we are immature, sensitive rebels. And we don't like being told what to do. But if we praise the book or we position the book in the declarative, these are the steps we took, these are the things we did, that it would be much more palatable to the drunk. And Dr. Howard in New Jersey changed forever the method which the message could be conveyed. Not in the imperative. You do this and you do that. We don't like having a finger in our face. We've had enough of that. But if you show me what you've done, then when I'm in enough pain, I will begin to take action after action after action that I don't even yet believe in, but I will start to get relief from that action. And this is very, very, very important. Bill Wilson trying to get money. He's trying to get money for, for the book. He goes to Charlie Towns at the Towns Hospital. He gets a $25 loan from Charlie Towns, and he gives Charlie a promissory note. He's borrowing money from other people. The printer was, was contacted, not the publisher, the printer, who was an Oxford Group member named Blackwell. And Blackwell was a printer that they knew from the Oxford Group movement, and he decides he will help them, but he needs money to get going. And they take out, five, they want 5,000 of the first edition, first printing, of which I have one, um, that was a gift to me by some beautiful person. But anyway, they decide they're going to print 5,000 books. They're on the cuff to the printer. They're on the cuff to Charlie Town. They owe money all the way around. And now... The book is finished in 1939, and they want to get the book printed. But in 1939, President Roosevelt took off the restrictions on foreclosing mortgages that hadn't been paid. The Wilsons are now evicted from their 182 Clinton Street. They got the book in hock. They can't pay the printer. They can't pay the printer. They can't pay Charlie Towns, and they're in trouble. No kidding. They're in trouble and they don't know what to do. Well, this one guy that was drunk, Morgan Ryan, he was, he was a, 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 a big, tall Irish guy, and he came into program, and he was an advertising guy, and he knew this radio guy named Heater. And Heater, Gabriel Heater, had a syndicated radio program. 
And Morgan Ryan says, I think I can get an interview with Gabriel Heater, and that will give the book some publicity. So their spirits rose, and, and Morgan goes to Heater, and Heater decides, yes, I will interview you. You've got 15 minutes, you know, and they, they were afraid that Morgan was going to get drunk before the interview. It was 10 day laps between, yes, I'll do it, and, you know, the actual interview. So what they did was they, they ponied up for a room at the Downtown Athletic Club in New York City, and they paid another guy to stay with, with Morgan. What Morgan didn't realize is this guy had one job, make sure Ryan doesn't get drunk. So before the interview with Gabriel Heater, Hank Parker says, we need to do a mass postcard mailing to every doctor east of the Rocky Mountains. And they do that, and they're spending money that they don't have. And Gabriel Heater has Morgan on. The interview goes well, and they're thinking, man, our post office box is going to be full of requests for this book. There were six postcards in there, 10 postcards in there. Some of them they couldn't read. They, were, they looked like they were written by a drunk monkey or something, and they got two legible requests for the book as a result of the interview with, with, uh, with Heater. And Gabriel Heater's interview produced far less, obviously, than any, anyone could have possibly imagined. Now, they're, the Wilsons are foreclosed on. Their home is no longer their home. They're living with Fitzmayo and his, his wife. Um, Charlie Towns wants his money. The publish, the, not the publisher, the printer wants his money. He's about to take over the book project. He's about to say, screw you guys, you're not paying me. And Providence came in once again. Um, Bert Taylor, who also, well, before I, Bert Taylor was a, was a haberdasher in New York City who was a drunk. And he says to uh, Bill, I'm going to try to get you a loan of about $1,000. And he contacts a friend of his in Baltimore who, was, uh, who used to buy his pants from him. And that guy loaned them $1,000. They get through the summer of 38. 38, they're getting through. And all of a sudden, they get contacted by Liberty Magazine. And they're going, Fulton Ausler, is, the editor of Liberty Magazine, is going to publish an a, a article, Alcoholics and God. And that brought in a little bit of interest to the book. And then the Rockefellers came back into the picture. John D., he had been following what was going on with these guys. And in 1940, in February of 40, they're still broke. He gives another dinner for these guys. And he was sick. Nelson, uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller was his son. And he had to do the meeting because J.D. was, uh, J.R. was sick. And Willard Richardson was there, and there was Wendell Wilkie, who later ran for president of the United States. He was the president of Chase Bank. I mean, they figured, you know, Dr. Kennedy was there, and, you know, he talked about how he had treated Marty Mann, and she got sober. They figured they were backed up to about $2 billion. And once again, he gets up and says, but money will spoil this thing. And so he doesn't believe that they need any money. Well, what they did was they solicited people from that in 1940, 1939, 1940. For four or five years, they got a few thousand dollars from these people that were at that meeting. But John D. Rockefeller bought from them several hundred books. He bought 400 books from them, and they gave it to him for a buck a piece. And Mr. Rockefeller put personal notes in each book to each banker that was there and some that were not there, encouraging that they support this movement. And he gave them $1,000, and they figured, well, if he gave 1000 I can give 100 or I can give 50 or whatever it is or 10 or whatever it is. And that money turned out to be a blessing. Now, we're almost at the end here. What happened? Jack Alexander in the Saturday Evening Post, who was an investigative reporter, did an article on Alcoholics Anonymous. And in, the, in, in that article, and because of the positive publicity, 
from an investigative reporter who was trying to find something wrong with Alcoholics Anonymous. And the book started taking hold and the group started sending in their money. Alcoholics Anonymous became a national institution. It is through Providence that the Rockefellers did not give them money. It is through God and his providence that it came together as it did. And Alcoholics Anonymous is to this day the only organization that was given money by the Rockefellers and their friends where every dime was paid back. And we no longer accept outside donations. And this book that we hold so dear in our hands and in our hearts that we refer to came about as a result of calamity and strife and suffering and fear. They didn't know what was going to happen. Everything almost went down the toilet, but it didn't because God in his infinite wisdom wanted it to be so. And the Yiddish word of the day is bashert. Bashert is usually a word that we use when a man or woman or whatever, two women, two men, when they meet somebody that is their true love. We say it's bashert. It was meant to be. The book is bashert. It was meant to be. And with that, Leah, I'm done. I'll pass. Thank you. Thank you, Harlan, for this magnificent telling of the riveting and impossible and miraculous story of the big book. Thank you so very much. The share ID for this morning's presentation is 10714. That's 10,714. Harlan's contact information will be offered at the conclusion of the recording, so stay tuned for that. And we'll now transition to a question and answer segment to see if anyone has any questions regarding what was uh, shared this morning, the history of the big book. Star one to unmute if you have a question. And of course, announce your name with the first initial of your last name as well, please. Judith R. T. Did I hear Judith R? Yes. Okay. And Nancy H. Nancy H. Robin, Robin P. Robin B. There was somebody as in P. Robin I. As in Palmer. Okay. Lori okay. T. Lori T. Excellent. Okay, so that's a good group. Let's start with Judith R., then we'll go to Lori T., please. Judith R. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Harlan. Um, my question is, Harlan and all the vision for you, when are you going to come to Brattleboro, Vermont, and see the Brattleboro Retreat as it is now? <laughs> well, we were passing through, and my... Um, my dear friend and sponsor, uh, I think he envisions himself as an Indianapolis 500 uh, driver. So we were going through there at about, uh, I would say, roughly 150 miles an hour. No, I'm kidding. He was actually very good. That he was, he was actually driving very well that day. Um, I really, we didn't have time, honestly. It was the time when the Boston Convention was going, and we took a side trip, and we went to East Dorset, and we went to Bill's grave, Lois's grave. And uh, we saw a bunch of the Wilsons where they're buried, and uh, Leonard Strong is buried there, too. It was very, very moving. And anybody that hasn't seen that, get your tuchus up there to East Dorset, Vermont. Get your tuchus over to Clinton Street, 182 Clinton Street, and get your tuchus to Stepping Stones. Stepping Stones is a very moving, moving, moving trip that you take up there and you go into their home. But we just didn't have the time to really explore. But I think we had lunch somewhere. I wish Jen was on the line. No, anyway, that's okay. I think we had lunch someplace right near Brattleboro. I think that we did. So I think we experienced anyway breathing their air. So, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Lori T., your turn. <clears throat> Gosh, thank you so much. That was, I'm going to listen to that again as soon as, as, soon as I'm done. That was just riveting. And it brought up a number of um, interesting questions I have. So I, I, hope you, I hope you can enlighten me on these just based on, on what you think. So, one, I was curious about what you think, because I don't know about the history. That's why I'm so enriched. What did you think about um, the number three 
psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, having so so he didn't identify him on the first visit that he was the hopeless variety. It took him a year of treatment. And then he goes out and gets drunk, and then he says that. And my question is, do you think again it, it was the odd God thing that he didn't recognize on? If I get the name right, Ebby's first arrival that he was hopeless. It seems to me Roland. that a guy. Oh, Roland, Roland's thank you. Roland's first arrival, yes. Um, it seems to me that a psychiatrist of that degree of specialization and regard would have recognized that initially. That was one thing. The second thing I wanted to ask was when you said that that um, Bill had this uh, thing to, to go with 12 steps. And so my question is, were the people that were recovered prior to that only using six steps and then Bill kind of dissected them into 12, or were they – and did he kind of extract those from the six, or had people been doing the 12 and they'd only been calling them six? And then my last and final question was, I think I heard somewhere that this Ebby actually relapsed. And what was his demise? This, um, I'll, what take, this, I'll take them in reverse order. I'll take the questions in reverse order. Ebby got drunk and got sober, got drunk and got sober, and he lived a lot of his life at the end in Dallas, Texas. He died sober in Boston Spa, New York. And um, Bill went out of his way to make Ebby know that he loved him, and he always identified Ebby as his sponsor. But Ebby did get drunk and get sober, get drunk and get sober. Uh, the second question I forgot, what about Carl Jung identifying Roland as an alcoholic? I don't think Dr. Jung was very familiar with alcoholism. It was not something that he studied. It was not something that he really recognized in, in Roland. But then when Roland came back after being in Paris, he said to him, you're an alcoholic, you're hopeless. What was your other question? It was this okay. movement from the, there was... Um, oh, the 12 was, steps. Is, yes, how we got from the six early to 12 guys got sober, The early guys got sober on a six-step program. The six-step program and the 12-step program were very similar. He just wanted to close some of the loopholes. He wanted to close some of the loopholes that these guys were jumping through. And step eight was very important. He wanted them to list the people that they, that they had harmed. And he wanted step three in there, making a decision to turn your life, which is your action and your will, which is your thinking, over to the care and direction of God. He also wanted an 11th step in there, prayer and meditation. Even though the Oxford groupers were very big on prayer and very big on meditation, he wanted that in there as well. And step 10, where you continue to take personal inventory. And, you know, of course, we know that the two of the underutilized steps are 2 and 10. So the 10th step really came about as a result of his, his closing some of the loopholes. But that's, I hope that answers it. It did. Thank you so much. And thank you so much okay. for this wonderful information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lori T. Nancy H., your turn. Hi, this is Nancy H., a recovering compulsive overeater in New Jersey. Um, thank you so much for that tremendous uh, story of the big book. It was so riveting and enlightening. It was just fantastic. Um, one thing I just wanted to share is that um, I'd gotten sober in AA 31 years ago, and um, but in the past year, just listening to A Vision for You and really studying the big book has opened up the big, big book in a whole new way. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Bill Wilson's house and, and seeing all that many years ago. But I am just fascinated, fascinated by the big book and how it's working um, for me today and how I'm able to, to turn my life up. But my one question briefly is I was taking notes and looking up things um, the one thing I couldn't, didn't quite get was the Lewis Brown book, Disbelieving. Um, could you enlighten me Disbelieving on that? Disbelieving World. I, I don't really have a lot of information on it. Uh, it's called okay. Disbelieving World by Lewis Brown. But you can, oh, okay. uh, it's, an outside, it's an outside thing. So I, but I needed to mention it because it, it, did, it did influence them. It did influence them. But it is an outside thing, so I don't have an opinion on it. Okay. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy H. Robin P. Star one to unmute.
Hi, this is Robin P. I'm a grateful, recovered, compulsive overeater um, in Los Angeles. And thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Um, so my question is, hold on a second. My phone is in a new case, and I hope you can hear me here. I just took it out. Um, Robin P. I'm a grateful, recovered, compulsive overeater in Los Angeles. And thank you so much, Harlan. Oh, my goodness. This was tremendous. And it was perfect timing. I'm, I'm actually an inventor, and I've been going through a bunch of things with manufacturers lately and having to just keep saying yes and keep going, and this was so inspiring. So <laughs> um, my question is, so, you know, as with any new venture or birth of something, usually investment is needed. Why did Rockefeller say no to investment? I understand, like, huge chunks, but... How did he come up with a thousand, and why did he do that? But he wouldn't help them more. And then, how did Bill Wilson and the rest of the founders survive after that? What was the way that they were able to, you know, keep the, going after? The Rockefeller, uh, Mr. Rockefeller knew that if he pumped a bunch of money into this thing, it would spoil it. Um, it had to be a venture that they themselves controlled. It had to be for alcoholics, by alcoholics. And he saw that very clearly. And he knew that if he subsidized them to a great degree, it would become his project, not their project. So it would be Rockefeller telling people, here's a book, don't drink. And he knew that it would have much greater effectiveness if they did it. Um, in keeping with that, Dr. Silkworth's opinion, the doctor's opinion in the first printing, first edition, uh, was on page one, and then they moved it. They moved it to the Roman numeral section because Silky wasn't an alcoholic, and the body of the book must be for alcoholics, by alcoholics. And now I have forgotten the second part of your question. Could you refresh my memory, Robin? Yes, thank you. So my second, yep, my second question was, so how did they proceed from there financially once how did they proceed from there financially? They did. They did yeah, like well. Did, they did fine. Did Bill, they did very like well. How did, how did Bill survive? Like what happened so that he wasn't addicted anymore, and you know that kind of thing. That he wasn't addicted anymore. He worked the program. Like, so that, he had a spiritual experience in 1934. So he never drank again. But the the no, money no, started no. coming in from the book. Oh, okay, and that funded. The money started and, coming in from the book. Really, the catalyst was the, was the uh, Jack Alexander article in the Saturday Evening Post. And they got 7,000 requests for books as a result of the Saturday Evening Post article. And uh, Alexander actually wrote another article in 51, but just to stay within this, um, that 7,000 actually coincided with the groups really expanding. Uh, Hank Parkhurst got drunk, died drunk. Uh, he didn't stay sober very long after the book was written. He wrote, a, he wrote a story in the first edition called The Unbeliever, and not too long after the book was actually published and the split came AA from the Oxford group, he got drunk and stayed that way. Um, Bill Wilson did fine. He died in 1971, January 24th, 1971, in Miami, Florida. Dr. Bob lived the re rest of his life um, liquor-free and died in 1950, November of 50, in, in Akron, Ohio. And people came in, got drunk, got sober, got drunk, got sober. But the main, the main players in the AA picture, with the exception of Ebby, uh, stayed sober. They stayed sober. I Thank hope that you. answers it, Robin. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Robin. Jody EQ. Did you have a question this morning? Star one to unmute. Yes, I'm here. Good Thanks, morning, Jody. everybody. Uh -huh. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, Harlan. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, where you're learning all of this and what uh, books or other uh materials you're learning all well, of I'll give you I'll give you some some information. Now pass it on. 
which is the AA Bill Wilson story. Pass it on is one I would recommend. I would also recommend AA Comes of Age. I would recommend strongly Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. There are other biographies of Bill Wilson that I would recommend to you. I'm not going to name them as they are outside enterprises, outside issues. But go to your web or go to your bookstore. There are biographies of Bill, and they are helpful. And there is a major source of information here on the Internet. I study this constantly. It's a passion of mine. I'm very passionate about this. These people saved my life. I never met them. Never, can't even thank them. Um, but they saved my life. Another book that I would definitely recommend to you is Roseanne's book called Beyond Our Wildest Dreams. The book about Leah hasn't been written yet, but I'm going to try to get in on that as an author. But um, I would be, recommend strongly Beyond Our Wildest Dreams by Roseanne S. And you can see the growth and the strife of early OA. January 19th, 1960 uh, was the first meeting. But I would recommend those books. And I would recommend that you peruse. Um, we have a store here called Gifts and On. And peruse those kind of places and you'll find a wealth of material a wealth of material there. But I would start with what I told you. Okay, so AA comes of age and what AA was the comes other? of age, pass it on, Dr. Bob and the good old timers. Um, what else did I tell you? Yeah. Um, and I would just you go online or go to a bookstore. There are other biographies of Bill and histories of mm -hmm. AA. Read them all. And read okay. Beyond Our Wildest Dreams by Roseanne S. Okay. Thank you so much, Harlan, for You're your welcome. passion. There are also books on the early history of the Oxford Group Movement, and I'm not going to recommend them in specifics, but I would, I would definitely look into those because that tells you where we come from. It'll talk to you about um, Sam Shoemaker. He had a tremendous influence on the big book. He said that there were four impediments to God, a resentment you will not let go of, a, vicar a secret you will not tell, a vicarious thrill that you will not stop, and a restitution that you will not make. Steps four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that comes right from Sam Shoemaker and the Oxford Group Movement. So these are things that you, if you want to study, I would start there. Thanks, Jody. Okay. Thank you, Harlan. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Jody. Who else has a question related to the history that was shared today. Star one to unmute. Roxanne P. Very good. Roz. Gavara F. F. John K. Pam H. Okay. Let me tell you who I heard, and then please fill me in on who I missed. Roxanne T. Craig F. Devora S. John K. Pam H. Who did I miss? Roz G. Roz G. Fabulous. Okay, Roxanne T., you're up. Thank you. Uh, can you still hear me? I do. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Roxanne T., recovering in New York. Thank you, Harlan, so much. What a great morning this is, listening you know, to the history. I have a little question. I don't know if this is an outside issue or not, but I've heard uh, through the Great Ball, <laughs> not the actual magazine, but uh, from people who've um, done big book studies and things like that, that on page 12, when uh, Ebby Thatcher visits uh, Bill uh, and is staying with him for a very long period of time, uh, and even though, uh, you know, Bill is amazed at Ebby, he's still having a real difficult time accepting uh, a God, accepting of a power, you know, greater than, you know, he, he, he believes in, you know, different things, creative, you know, intelligence, but he, he really, you know, uh, 
did not want to uh, do the God thing. It, it, he said it still arose a certain antipathy in him. Mm-hmm. And um, he had vestiges of his old prejudices going on. And Ebby, this is what I heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, mm-hmm. that Ebby was getting so frustrated with Bill about him at not accepting uh, the religious side. You know, he said, I've got religion, Ebby, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that he said the statement, why don't you choose your own conception of God in a manner of frustration where he just threw his arms up, you know, threw his arms up and said, Bill, you know, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And that the Oxford Society never would have schooled Ebby to do such a thing. They were very Christian based. They were, you know, they had their way. They they believed in God, you know, um, mm-hmm. and that, you know, a lot of people say this was, you know, God's way of opening this up to everyone by Ebby mm-hmm. making that statement. Why don't you choose your own conception of God? But I was told it was set out of frustration because he wasn't getting anywhere with Bill at the time. And my question mm-hmm. is, do you have any experience with that? Have you heard that? Uh, do you no. feel that's true? I have not heard that there was a lot written? of frustration between the two of them. No. They loved okay. each other very much. They were old friends. They were in, they were in school together in East Dorset. Um, they knew each other well. They had done a lot of drinking together. And I wasn't there, so I couldn't tell you. But I did sit at the kitchen table when I went to Stepping Stones. We all did, actually. Um, but we were at the kitchen table that they originally did this at. Um, but I had not heard that there was a lot of frustration. There may have been. I don't know. I wasn't there, obviously. But um, I had never heard that, so I don't know. I can't really speak to that. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you. Roxanne. I'm sorry I couldn't be more helpful. I'm sorry. You were helpful. Thanks, Thanks, Roxanne. Craig F., your turn. Star one to unmute, Craig. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, Harlan, very much for this, my friend. Thank you. you. uh, uh, Your your presentation and this history, it kind of illuminated, uh, you can see the formulation of, of the traditions, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about when and how those got kind of codified and codified and and formalized and how that came out of the big book or however. Thank you, Craig. That's a good question. The traditions really started getting introduced to the fellowship in 1945 in Grapevine Magazine. Grapevine Magazine is the monthly publication of AA exactly like our Lifeline Magazine is. And Bill and Bob knew that they could not forever be the governing forces of AA. Bob was getting sick. He had cancer. He died in 1950. But they were pondering some things in the aftermath of this book history. And somebody said to Bill and Bob, you better be careful or we're going to go the way of the Washingtonians. The Washingtonians were a group of people in 1840 that were formed to get drunks sober. And the Washingtonians got mired in the three Ps, property, politics, and prestige. And they faded off the scene. They endorsed outside enterprises. They had Washingtonians who believed that there should be no slavery. And they would go and they would say, don't, don't you know, abolish slavery. And then they'd have other Washingtonians that would say, we want uh, this or we want that law passed. And so they faded off the scene very quickly because they got embroiled in outside enterprises. And the Washingtonians served as a cautionary tale for the AAs who learned about what was going on with them. And so the, the traditions really began getting introduced to the fellowship in 1945. And in 1950, at the Cleveland Convention, they were ratified and they, were, they became part of what we do. And then in 51 and 52, the 12 and 12 was written, came out in 53, the AA 12 and 12, not the OA. The OA, there was no OA yet. OA wasn't even formed until 1950. But the AA traditions came about as the result of what the Washingtonians taught us through their cautionary tale. And some of the things that we just talked about this morning about outside contributions, 
uh, the one who pays the band uh, calls the tune, and they saw that there was mistakes. And these traditions are vital to our survival. Incidentally, one of the most beautiful sources of information on the traditions is in OA, the OA 12 and 12. I'm not real big on their, uh, you know, some of their stuff in the front part of the book, but in the back of the book in the traditions, there's some really good information. But that's really how it came about. Thanks, Craig, for your question. I hope that answers it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Craig. Devora S., your turn, star one, to unmute. <clears throat> Devora? Devora S., star one, to unmute. Oh, I was busy talking over there. Good morning. Thank you, Harlan and Larry, for this Thank presentation. Thank you. And, you know, you talked about Newark. My husband was born and bred in Newark on Clinton. Now, are you talking about Clinton Street in Newark? Or is that Will, Will, 17 Williams. 17 Williams Street was the Office of Honor Dealers, Honor Dealership, and they were in the automobile polish business, which failed. And that's where uh-huh. the, most of the book was written, was at 17 Williams Street in Newark. Okay. And what's Clinton? What was, you mentioned something about Clinton Street. Where was in that? In Brooklyn Heights, New York. In Brooklyn, oh, in Brooklyn. Heights, New York, okay. near the river. 182 Clinton Street was where the Burnhams had lived. The Burnham, Lois's family were the Burnhams. Dr. Burnham was her father. And they, Bill and Lois lived at 182 Clinton Street, and then they were evicted in 1939. Where uh-huh. they changed the law and they could, okay. they could evict them. Okay, so my husband grew up on Clinton Street in Newark, and his uh-huh. grandparents, like his grandparents, even had a liquor store in Newark, New Jersey, until the riots came along, and that was it. So that was just, uh-huh. just sharing that today. Anyway, now thank you so much. If, if any of you are coming to the OA birthday, which I recommend strongly that you do, there's a, there's a liquor store in Los Angeles. I kid you not. I'm, I, you can't make this up. There's a liquor store in Los Angeles called AA Liquor. <laughs> I find that hysterical. I find that absolutely hysterical. Anyway, okay, sorry. I had to throw that in. Well, Come thank you for the clarity. Thank you for the clarity. No thank you. No right, problem. Bye-bye. Thank you, Devora. Speaking of L.A., John K., you're up. Star one, ton you, John. Good morning. This is John Kiernan, recovered from <laughs> overeater, driving no, no, at 110 no. miles an hour down the highway. <laughs> well, should I tell uh, a story or not? I don't know. No, you can tell a story. Let me uh, first. My first, I have two questions. Two questions for you. You mentioned okay. Dr. Howard. Was he part yeah. of that famous medical group, Dr. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Howard? <laughs> I think and, he was. Yes. Yeah. I think he was. <laughs> and also, you mentioned in Newark. I wanted to make sure I understood. Did Eddie have the gravy stain on the left side of his shirt or on the right side of his shirt? <laughs> None of your funny stuff. He had it on the right side. He was right here. Okay. The gravy fell down on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and I, I actually loved your whole thing. And uh, uh, just to clarify, we had lunch in Manchester, uh, Vermont. And uh, I'll okay. shut up and let you share whatever nasty stories you want to tell. Okay. John was driving me in Los Angeles, and we went past. He had to show me this place called Randy's Donuts. Not that we stopped for donuts. Take it easy. We didn't stop for donuts, but he wanted to show this to me because it's in a lot of television shows and a lot of movies and stuff like that. He makes a U-turn right in front of a Los Angeles policeman. Get the ticket. Anyway, I'm sorry. I had to throw that in there. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, next. Sorry. (laughs) Thank you, John, for your question. Okay, Pam H., your turn. Star one ton, you please. Hi, thank you, thank you so much for your sharing strength and hope in the story of the AA Big Book. I am Pam. Um, just in the middle of doing something. Um, I had uh, joined an SI group of AA members who started a group over 68 years ago, and they had a lot of the history on the wall. And um, they do have a mantra. They do have a mantra. 
you know, substituting the cup that's sub- substituting the cup that's sanctified for the cup that's sanctified. And they um, subsidize what? Wait a minute. I, they subsidize what? Substituting the cup that sanctifies for the cup that stupefies. And okay. anyhow, it's, it's, it's all started by AA members over 68 years ago. And um, there's a letter on the wall from Bill to uh, this particular group many, many years ago. But there's also pictures of a priest and nun. And so says, you know, they were in the beginnings of the startings of AA. And I I'm, I could be mistaken, but I don't think I heard any mentioning of them. And would like to know if they were in the beginnings and that the group I'm rebelled. I'm going to guess. And that the group rebelled and threw them out. <laughs> That's all I have to No, say. they didn't rebel and, and throw anybody and, out. And, and I'm going to guess that the sister was, the nun was Sister Ignatia and the priest was Sam Shoemaker. Sam Shoemaker was not a priest in the Catholic Church. He was an Episcopalian minister. And Sam Shoemaker is a very, very important part of our history because Sam Shoemaker gave these guys the information that led to the, some of the formation of the steps. This is Sister Ignatia is the nun. And Sister Ignatia was the assistant to Dr. Bob in Akron. And Sister Ignatia, if it wasn't for her care and it wasn't for her hard work, I don't know that we would that we would be here today. Sam Shoemaker is the is the guy in the he's not really a priest he's an Episcopal minister but it looks very similar I can understand yeah I can understand why you think it's a priest. He taught the boys that there were four impediments to God, a resentment that you will not let go of. Step four, a secret that you will not tell. Step five, a vicarious thrill stealing, lying, cheating, gossiping that you will not stop, step six and seven, and a restitution. They didn't use verbiage in the Oxford group like amend. Their verbiage was restitution. So it was a restitution that you will not make. And those two people, Sister Ignatia and Sam Shoemaker, are part of the reason that not only am I still alive, but I have lost over 500 pounds I have 18 and a half years. I have almost 19 years now of abstinence if I make it. And not only am I alive, but I am free of the food and I am doing so happily. But if it wasn't for Sister Ignatia and if it wasn't for Sam Shoemaker, this little Jewish boy from Devon Avenue in Chicago would not have survived. So those are very important players in all this. Thanks. I hope that answers it. Thanks, thanks so much. There, yeah, I, I I know there was a priest, and his picture's up there. I, I know it was a Protestant uh, minister that, you know, um, wrote the... Uh, Sam Shoemaker and Sister Ignatia. Okay, and it's the Catholic Society. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. And our final question for today comes from Roz G. Star 1 to unmute Roz. Hi, uh, this is Roz G, Recovered Compulsive Overeater in Los Angeles County. And more of a, uh, I'd like to make a couple of statements more than questions. And they are, um, it's very important, Harlan, you, you inspire me to, to do research. I think it's very important that some of us who, you know, like history, like to do research and report it to keep, um, the tradition uh, to keep these, um, for the lack of a better word, stories going, so that um, people who are uh, comp- that rise up to be compulsive overeaters in the future have us to be able to tell these magnificent historical accounts of how the big book was 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 made. So I want to thank you for that inspiration, because every time you mention a book, I get one. And and I'm grateful that I was at one of the birthday parties a few years ago where Roseanne was out signing books, and you were walking around her, and she, and she had a, a shake, and the, um, her signature is a little bit shaky in, in the book, Beyond Our Wildest Dreams, but because of your talk and um, my getting, the, my abstinence meaning more and more to me, I, that book is like a, a treasure for me. So I just wanted to really thank you for your passion and the inspiration that you give me to the research. You're welcome. Thank you, Roz. 
Yes, thank you, Roz. Thanks to everyone who asked questions, and thank you, Harlan, for that passion, for your inspiration, and for your continued excellence as a messenger in Overeaters Anonymous. We appreciate you very much. Let's close from page 164. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then.